I'm Jansen. I'm the student director. I've been doing it for like, I don't know, a year and a half now on staff officially. Um, but I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed my experience here in Restore Students. Um, so just to give you a little bit about me, uh, I'm young, 27, lots of life experience in this body. Uh, I've got uh, a beautiful wife named Danny, beautiful baby boy. It's a, almost a year and a half, holy cow. Uh, and of course, our, our dog, Rusty, who we love, we love dearly most of the time. He's a big 80 pound greyhound and oh boy, is he something. If you would have uh, asked me two years ago where I would be right now, today, it wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be right here doing this right now. And that's not even just with speaking, that's, that's being a part in like a, a, a church ministry, uh, being on staff at a church. And it's crazy to me thinking back at uh, my life and the specific t steps that I took, sometimes they were unknown, uh, to get me to this point. Looking back at it now, I can see that everything was God ordained. God was guiding every single step uh, to get me to where I am now. Restore Students is a place where students can be comfortable, where they can be safe, where they can feel at home, where they're not scared of uh, going and worrying about people making fun of them or, 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 or people uh, not liking them or not feeling like they fit in. Restore Students is a place where we can get closer to each other and get closer to Jesus. And this is gonna be a sh uh, just a, a nice pitch for you here. We can be a part of changing trajectories in students' lives. I can't, I, can't, I can't imagine where I would be right now without my student experience. And my student ministry experience changed the trajectory of my life. So I and a few of our, uh, our adult leaders get to be a part of changing that trajectory. And selfishly, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever been a part of in my entire life. It is so cool to see students turn around and start walking toward Jesus. It is the coolest thing. So if you'd like to volunteer and restore students, come talk to me, because it's worth it, it's great. So we talk about steps, right? We talk about taking those steps. How, how do we know what those steps are toward our, our calling, if you will, the big C? How do we know uh, where uh, we're going? How do we know we're taking the right step in the first place? Is this what God wants us to do, or is this just something that I wanna do? This is kind of like, oh yeah, I guess I'll go play in a rock band play bass in a rock band? And is this what God wants me to do? Ah. Uh -huh. So the best way that I learned, uh, just in general, is from example. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this book. It's called The Bible. Uh, we've got a lot of examples in the Bible. And uh, a, a really good, I don't know, guy, a father of our faith, Moses. You guys ever heard of Moses? I, I, I teach with students and they respond a lot. So I kind of need that now if you guys wouldn't mind. Do you guys know Moses? Okay, okay. If you don't, I'll give you a little synopsis here real quick. So Moses was a Hebrew boy born in Egypt. Pharaoh was like, yo, I don't like Hebrew boys. Firstborns in particular, I'm gonna kill all of them. So as anyone would do, a mom took her baby boy, put him in the Nile. It's like, hey, God, I'm trusting you. Like, you got this. Sure enough, God did got this. And he uh, had Pharaoh's daughter find Moses in the, in the river. Wow, that seems like luck, huh? So Pharaoh raises Moses up in the Egyptian courts, uh, in the Egyptian uh, school system. Um, so he's a whiz, super smart, maybe. He, uh, he sees the, the wrongdoing of his people uh, and he kills a taskmaster because uh, the Hebrews were slaves and he fled because Pharaoh was gonna kill him. So he fled to Midian. Midian's like, I'm gonna, like Wakarusa, there's nothing. 
I live in Wakarusa. I'm allowed to say that. There's nothing there. So all he has to do is herd sheep. So I'm going to read here, uh, starting in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Mind you, this is, I told Kiana I wasn't going to stop. I'm so sorry. This is, uh, who kn- we don't know how long it's been since he left Egypt to now. Okay, so in this time, he, he has a wife. I believe he has a son. And he's watching his, his father-in-law's sheep. Okay. Uh, so he's tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, a mountain, or the mountain of God, sorry. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that and thought, huh, that's interesting. He saw that and said, the bush was on fire, but it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I should go over there and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that, he had, uh, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Mo- Moses hid his face because he was fr- afraid to look at God. What an interesting response to a calling. Right, you think, hey, there's this burning bush and your first response is, here I am. Like, that's super humbling for me because he wasn't saying, yo, like, God, can you see me? Hey, I'm right here. He was saying, hey, I'm available. I'm emotionally ready for the calling. I am here. I know when I read the, uh, that part of Moses, I always try to think about what is my burning bush moment? What is my am I even called to this moment? But the thing is, just like Moses, we are already called. We're called to be Jesus to everyone around us. We're called to be the best mom, the best dad, the best child, the best boss, the the best employee. We are called to put your card away at the grocery store because that's what being called means. It means being a good person and following in the way of Jesus and showing the way of Jesus to everyone around us. Everything you do should be a reflection of your Lord and Savior. That's what we are called to. When most of us think of God's calling, we think of like this large type calling, like the, uh, the grand finale, the big moment where that we make that significant impact or uh, the center stage, larger than life calling, like writing a book or speaking in front of a ton of people at a stadium, becoming a pastor, being an Instagram influencer. That's what they do. We think of a calling as like a main event where that moment of impact is what God has called us precisely to. But it's not about the main event. It's actually kind of the opposite. It's about our everyday obedience. It's about what he tells you to do next, the little steps that you take. In uh, Genesis 12, uh, God tells Abraham to leave where he's at. He doesn't give him any more information. What does God do? Abraham leaves. He obeyed the call by responding. And, and then once he got to that land, he did the next thing that God told him to do one step at a time. So there's this, this re- repetitive motion of, of God calling and then nothing. What do you do in that nothing? You take small steps. Every act of obedience is one small yet profound step in our calling. Whether you've been walking with the Lord in obedience every single day or you want to start today, walking in God's calling is still available to us. Like it it never is not available. Doesn't matter what you've done, what you have not done, God calls the broken, God calls the mishaps and the, the unworthy ones too. I often feel unworthy and underqualified. 
And maybe you feel kind of like that. You feel unworthy for God to choose you and invite you into his purpose. But hear me when I say this, it doesn't matter the amount of sin, the amount of broken cracks, the amount of wounded scars you have. He will use every ounce of your life for his purpose. Romans 8, 28 says, we, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He will use your story no matter what. If you've gone off the path, it doesn't even matter because guess what? God's gonna use that story to encourage someone else who's in that same exact position. You never know what you're, what you're going through has uh, the impact. You don't know the impact that what you're going through has on other people. If you look at the, the stories, right? Some of the heroes that had significant callings. They came from a life with a not so significant past, a past that many in society would deem as unworthy and not good enough to be doing any sort of calling. Many had little skills that most would think aren't sufficient. Yet the Lord chose them and invited them to partner with him anyways. I mean, you look at the the disciples, right? They weren't the known and the wealthy. They were kind of the opposite. They're fishermen, most of them. Do you think that fishermen have the skills and the abilities and the talents known right now to to preach the word of the gospel? I've been doing this for a year and a half and I feel like I can't even preach, right? They're not even in the same career path. It's crazy to me. Let's go to Exodus 4, 10 through 12, because Moses is kind of feeling the same way. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow in speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them the sight or makes them blind? It is, not, is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I'll help you speak and I'll teach you what to say. If you for one moment think you're not good enough, worthy enough for God to make an impact on the people around you and use you, look at Moses. Moses. The dude couldn't talk. He had a speech impediment. And God still used him and said, hey, you're gonna go talk to Pharaoh and you're gonna convince this guy, the king of the the land, probably the biggest nation at the time, and you're gonna say, hey, all those slaves that you have, yeah, you don't need them anymore. The calling ahead of you is way, way bigger than anything behind you. He called you for such a time as this, right? He formed you and knit you together in your mother's womb. He set you apart before you were even born. He anointed you. He selected you. Let's go to Exodus 4. Uh, We're going back a little bit in this conversation with the Lord. Exodus 4, verses 1 through 5. Moses answered, What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This said the Lord, 
is so that they may, may believe that the Lord the, and God of your fathers, the, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. I think it's so interesting that God can use the things around you, the tools that you have at your disposal for something completely different than what you think. A staff is, to, is meant to herd sheep, right? Fight off lions, bears, tigers, oh my. And God said, no, nah, I'm gonna use that for something completely different now. I'm gonna use that as a sign of my power. Just as God equipped Moses to lead the Israelites with teaching and with speech, he, sent to, or he gave him Aaron, his brother-in-law, or his brother, sorry, his brother. He gave him Aaron so that they could tag team the speech thing. Just as as God kept his promise to give Joshua victory over the Canaanites, just as God gave Esther the courage to go before the king, he will also equip us for the tasks that he gives us. As Paul puts it, uh, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God doesn't call us to something only to leave us to fend for ourselves. He doesn't let the broken glass spread around us after we're pulling something out of the cupboard and say, good luck, see you later. No, he comes in and picks you up out of that glass, right? He's got shoes on, he's fine. God will give you the tools you need when you need them. And I know it's so easy to say, man, is it hard to believe when you're in the thick of it, right? Okay, so you're already called. You are enough. You're capable to complete your calling. You're equipped for your calling. How the heck do you even know what your calling is in the first place? I was, uh, I'm doing 75 hard. I don't know if you guys know about that, but it's kind of cool. Uh, It's like a mental workout exercise thing for 75 days. One of the requirements is I have to run or do an outside exercise. Um, I was at my parents' house. Hi, parents, they're here. They live on a farm in the middle of nowhere where it's dark. And I mean like, not like dark. Like you put your hand in front of your face when you go outside and you can't see your hand. You guys know how that is? You're in the basement in the middle of the night, that that kind of dark. So I was like, oh crap, it's 9.30, whatever. I've got to go for a run. They've got a road. It's like a mile long. So I'm just running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So dad hands me this flashlight this is a bit like, I, I, was, I wanted like just a little thing so my arm wouldn't get heavy, you know? And he got the, like this giant torch. It's like the size of my head. So I'm running, I'm kind of doing one of these. And I'm casting this light out in front of me. And they live kind of out in a wooded area. There's a field and then a tree line. So I'm running, got my AirPods in so I can't hear anything around me. And I'm looking at this tree line and I'm thinking, There are coyotes out here, like a lot of them. Have you guys ever heard a coyote? You guys ever heard a coyote? They're freaky. So I'm thinking about the freaky noises that the coyotes are making, like, and I'm I'm kind of losing my mind a little bit. So much to the point where I'm running, and I'm like looking back, checking behind me to make sure that there's no coyotes at my heels, ready to eat me or something. I don't know what coyotes do. And I don't know why, but I just had a realization that, all right, I'm going to take my flashlight off of this this tree line here. I'm going to put it down on the path, and I'm only going to worry about what my next step is. And I even thought to myself, huh, that could be a good a little, a little analogy for when I teach at, the, at students. And sure enough, Gene asked me to teach like the next week, and I'm like, well, shoot, what am I supposed to speak about? I don't know, maybe taking your next step. But so, sometimes we get so worked up, right, in our big C calling, our, our big impact moment that we forget so much about the 90%, 90% of the rest of our calling. The tree line, that's 10%. Our calling is, our 90% of our calling, we have clear instruction. I get so worked up about what I'm gonna do with my life and will this be impactful and I just wanna make the biggest impact I can. For what? How? Why? What are you doing right now? 
So I'm going to give you two easy steps to find your calling. And this is going to be a letdown for some of you who think, yep, he's going to tell me that I'm going to be the next NBA All-Star. I'm going to be Kobe. I'm not going to say that. This isn't like that. If you are, you're welcome. I gave you that inspiration and remember me when you're famous. First thing, really simple. Come to Jesus. Your first calling is to Jesus. You are called to a person first, not a task. You're invited into a relationship and not a list of rules. Your highest purpose and calling have nothing to do with your job, with your education, with your marital status. Your highest calling is simply to Jesus. Matthew 11, uh, verse 28. Come to me, all who are all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He invites us into a relationship with himself. And his only request is that we hand over our burdens and take on his way, which is easy and light. That doesn't seem like a bad deal. Second thing, be faithful. If we look at the life of Paul, it seems to demonstrate this quite perfectly. Um, it's funny, Brenda, you're talking about waiting during the prayer and praise moment. So going to Paul's story a little bit, even after Paul meets Jesus on the road of Damascus and, and he begins preaching the gospel, people are still really suspicious of him. They're not sure because remember he was Saul and he was killing a lot of the people that were like him now. So as you would be, I'm sure, as I would be, I'm like, oh, I don't know about this guy. Like he's just trying to get into the club so he can wipe us all out. So everyone's suspicious of him. They're afraid of him. Some people want to kill him. After this happened uh, in a couple of locations, Paul and his team were like, okay, I'm not sure what's next. Uh, they decided that it was best to send him off back to his home in Tarsus. And I don't think, I, don't, I didn't know this until I was studying for this. Uh, Paul spent 10 years in his hometown waiting for God to reveal the next steps for him in his life. 10 years, God was called, or Paul was called, tried it out a little bit, and he's like, uh-oh, okay, I'm just gonna chill. 10 years. The guy who God miraculously appeared to and saved, the biggest transformation would eventually write much of the New Testament, spent a decade waiting for God's next steps. What did he do during that time? I don't know. Often referred to as the silent years, so we don't really know what's going on. We know he worked. I'm sure that he continued to preach the gospel to people around him. Other than that, we know that he was faithful with what was in front of him for 10 years. He just woke up every morning and said, all right, God, what do you have for me today? This is super hard for us in the 21st century, right? I believe there are two reasons why. We hate waiting. Do you guys know, you, you guys ever get up to a stoplight, right? And you see one lane has three cars and the other lane has, has one. You're like, mm, skirt, I'm gonna go over to the one because I wanna be half a millisecond faster than the people over next to me. We hate waiting. We want everything now, whether it's our Amazon deliveries, which have same day shipping now, which is crazy. Our meal, McDonald's, come on. Answers, we got Google. We've been, become so accustomed to getting everything as soon as Alexa has it, right? And as we wait, the salt in the wound is our access to other people's callings. We see it on social media, right? The lifestyle and the success of, of different people in our lives. We've seen how even their kids have like surpassed our success. Even their kids. 
So you might be thinking, what the heck am I waiting for? And I'm sure Paul was thinking that too, right? Those 10 years were not a waste. And they're not a waste for you. Can you look back at a time of waiting and acknowledge that God was forming you and using those years to refine and strengthen you? No matter how small you think the work is during those years, it's about being faithful to what's right in front of us because that's what he's called us to today. Faithfulness in the little things. Not only are the waiting years times for growth and transformation, but they also give us the chance to be faithful in the little things. Luke 16, 10 uh, begins with Jesus saying, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. What is the faithful little thing for you? What's been placed in front of you? The thing that's making it easy to look to the future and say, when I get there, then I'll do this. When this happens, then I'll do what? All the while he's telling you to be faithful in the small things. Maybe it's a job that you don't like. Maybe you feel like you're supposed to be there for, for a reason. Lean into that. Maybe you don't like your marriage. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe God's asking you to be, to be obedient and faithful in your friendships. Maybe you've got some friends that are just a little icky. The decision we make in the hidden place, those everyday littles will shape our destiny. Day by day, the Father is using what's in front of us to conform us more in the likeness of his son. That's our second clear calling. And through that, we can expect to kind of hear from God about what our specific callings are, that our steps will lead to our big calling, right? Remember though, this isn't like a genie in the bottle, like I said at the beginning. This isn't gonna be like, okay, if I'm faithful and I wait a really long time, I think the longer I wait, the better the calling. It's not like that. But something that helps me uh, when I think of that, I don't know who said this, but it's, it's, it's really cool. When asking God wants me to do, when asking what God wants me to do, remember that we are not human doings. We are created in God's image as human beings to communicate and walk in harmony with him. Doing is the result of being. Ben, you can come up. Definitely forgot to, to ask you to come up, but you guys can come up now. Hey, I'm new to this. This is the first time. What do you want from me? I'm gonna say that again. Doing is a result of being. Birds sing because they are birds. They don't sing in order to become birds. They sing, they fly, they feather their nests because of who they are. So what God really wants is for all of our doings to emanate from our being. He has no interest in grudging actions or things that don't have any connections with our heart. Whatever we do for God must come from a place of overflowing love, overflowing worship, over, overflowing surrender. So what is, what, is your, what is your next little thing? If you're anything like me, it's very apparent and you don't wanna do it. My next little thing was saying yes to Gene when he asked me to speak. I don't know why I didn't wanna do it. Probably, actually, I know why it's freaky up here. Y'all staring at me. But if you trust that God's got you in his hands and relinquish, relinquish control, right? Say, God, my life is yours. I surrender to you. What is my next thing? It can be really, really tiny. It can also be kind of big. We're gonna start worship here. I'm gonna ask the, the prayer ministry team to come up. I'm gonna pray us out, all right?
Hey, God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for these amazing students up here leading us in worship, leading us in battle. God, thank you for every single one of their gifts and abilities that they're choosing to take that next step and use for you. God, I pray that you make apparent to us what our next little thing is, what our next small step is. God, I pray that you help us be open. We use this term a lot in students. I hope, I pray that we, we're hot. I pray that we're honest, open, and transparent with ourselves and with one another, God, that we don't have to shy away from what you're calling us to next, but that we can step into it. God, pray for courage, pray for joy. Thank you, Jesus, amen.